I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and welcome to American Architecture Now. With us to begin our series of conversations with American architects are three men whose careers bring together nearly every working reality of urban architecture today. Urban planning, urban design, finance, legislation, education, and of course, the often exhilarating, often exasperating, fine art of architecture. On the far right is Richard Weinstein, an ex-psychologist and an architect who is now a consultant on urban design. One of the founders of the urban design group during the Lindsay administration, he went on to serve as director of the Office of Lower Manhattan Development. He was also among the fathers of the Museum of Modern Art condominium plan. He is now vice president of the city at 42nd Street, a massive communications, cultural, and entertainment complex being proposed for the West 40s in Manhattan. And on my left is Jonathan Barnett. He is equally diverse in his achievements. Formerly director of New York City's Urban Design Group, he is a writer, critic, professor, and consultant to major cities on urban design problems. He is director of the Graduate Program in Urban Design at City College of New York, president of the Architectural League, and the author of numerous articles and highly regarded books, including Urban Design as Public Policy. Another is entitled The Architect as Developer, and it is on the work of John Portwin, on the work of John Portman, with whom he has written that book. And on my right is John Portman, one of the nation's best-known architects. His firm is based in Atlanta. John Portman pioneered in our time the notion of architect as real estate developer. His Hyatt Regency Hotel in Atlanta sparked the current trend toward atrium hotels and propelled him into the major league of real estate developers. His best known works are Peachtree Center in Atlanta, the Bonaventure Hotel in Los Angeles, and the Renaissance Center in Detroit. <laughs> the newest of the series of famous hotels is the, one, is the one currently planned for Times Square. A warm welcome to you all. Thank you for taking times, time from your crowded schedules to join us this evening. All three of you are concerned with cities. In the case of two of you, with cities more than with individual buildings. Perhaps we should begin by your telling us, in a nutshell, what urbanism is about. It is a word we throw around without much of a definition. Can you provide one with us? In fact, Jonathan, I've heard you define urban design as designing a city without designing the buildings. Just what does that mean? Well, maybe what I could do is describe a kind of conflict of interest which could exist for an architect who is designing a building in a city between what would be best for the client and what would be best for the architect and uh, rather best for the city itself. For example, in Pittsburgh, where I am a consultant, there's a new building being planned by U.S. Steel. And the real estate interests behind it want that building to be at a corner which they have identified as a good place to rent the building. However, that is right next to H.H. H. Richardson's masterpiece, the Allegheny County Courthouse. So we have suggested to the developers that they shouldn't put their building exactly next to the building next door because of the discontinuity between the two structures. So you have a conflict, if you like, between what's best for Grant Street in the city and what the, at least the owners of the building think is best for them. One is architecture, the other is urban design. So that's at least part of the answer to your question. What's the difference between urban planning and urban design? Are they separate disciplines? Well, uh, at the sort of intuitive level, I would think that urban planning does not begin with aesthetics as a necessary starting point. Uh, aesthetic considerations are regarded, I would guess, as secondary to decisions about traffic and so on. At least there is a presumption that aesthetics are not part of economics or moving people out of subways. The urban designer, I think, would take the reverse position. He would say that aesthetic concerns are continuous with financial, political, and engineering concerns. So it, 
the, the urban designer comes from a different place, I guess you say, in contemporary parlance. I have a recorded announcement answer to that question also. Briefly, give it to us. <laughs> planning is the allocation of resources according to projections of future need. Of course, that's not done by planners. It's done by politicians. But that's what planning is. And urban design is the design of large-scale public spaces or the environment. There is an urban planning tradition that does involve graphs and statistical charts instead of architecture. I've often wondered how and when do those planners' tools get recombined with design, with art, and with physical forms? Perhaps you would reply to that, Mr. Portland. <clears throat> well, basically, uh, I think what we're talking about, we're talking about people. And, uh, you know, traffic is an important thing, and uh, all kinds of uh, technical, economical, and uh, financial uh, considerations are there. But uh, the base root of what we're talking about and an urban scene is the creation of a new kind of environment that puts people first. We start with people and we end with something that's physical. And uh, I think that's really uh, the basic fundamental that must be understood. The phrase that you've often used is planning for people. And I've never really been quite sure what you mean when you say that. How is that different? from what other architects do? Well, I think that uh, we're all creatures of nature. And uh, when we're working in, in architecture, unlike uh, painting or sculpture or different forms of art, architecture sits out in, 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 uh, on the corner and it's uh, exposed to everyone. Uh, from all classes, all backgrounds, uh, all educational. It's not elitist. It's for people. And uh, so I think that when we make that statement, we have to say, well, you know, how do we get at that? And the basic fundamental approach is to approach it from a, an, the innate reactions of people to environmental conditions. And the word innate is very important because innate means that uh, you eliminate uh, uh, prejudices uh, due to backgrounds and whatnot, and uh, you're dealing with creatures of nature. And the animal instinct uh, that's within us that responds to uh, physical environments uh, uh, is really where we start and we begin. And I think that uh, when we start thinking in terms of what kind of environment is going to create a, a positive response in, in all the people and not just a section of the people, not an elitist group or, or, or some other group. But uh, we have to deal with those common denominators, uh, which are constants. And I, I, I try to break them down into constants and variables. The constants are those innate things that people uh, respond to uh, because they're human. Uh, it's a human reaction that uh, they just uh, automatically uh, have a response to. Uh, the variables are those things that architects work with, such as sight and orientation and traffic and all those things. Uh, and the final design, of course, uh, is 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 a happy marriage between these constants and variables. And, uh, but we mustn't forget that the, the purpose, the essential purpose of architecture is a service to mankind. It's to, it's to provide a need, and hopefully not only functionally, but spiritually. How do you react to that, Richard? It's John's way of saying something that I think anybody who is in the design profession would have to uh, agree with. Um, I'm not sure, depending upon what scale you're working, approaching it from that point of view is more or less useful. Uh, I think um, if you want specific answers to um, sizes of things, you don't begin where John did. You ask other kinds of questions. If you're making fundamental 
if you're ranking values, what's more important than something else, then I think you do refer to the kinds of, of uh, concepts that uh, John does. He has a personal way of formulating these things. I think all of us confront these issues with different language tools, but I, have, I would have to agree with what he says. There are certain recurring themes to the Portman Festival. Variety, movement, water, nature, people watching people. Perhaps you can expand a bit more and describe to us your design philosophy. Well, <clears throat> the design philosophy begins with the individual. Uh, and it begins with me. I'm an individual. I'm a creature of nature. I'm a human being. I uh, have experienced things uh, and have recorded the impact of, uh, of architectural experiences, uh, uh, space, and have uh, tried to watch other people uh, when they don't realize that they're being watched and to record those reactions. Uh, uh, my philosophy really is to try to understand the human being uh, more. Uh, you know, uh, architects and the history of architecture, uh, going back to the pyramids and the great cathedrals and the Parthenon and all that, uh, testimonies to uh, political power, religious power, all these things. But, you know, uh, we haven't yet developed an architecture that really was concerned with the human being, uh, that is, uh, all of the people and not, uh, not to try to use it from a propaganda point of view. Uh, some of the great monuments that come down through history are, uh, were done uh, as propaganda. Uh, Julius II uh, uh, talked about building these great monuments because of the illiteracy uh, uh, of the public. Uh, and it was a way of uh, controlling uh, through these uh, great monuments uh, the masses. Uh, and, and when you go back and analyze the, and, and begin to see the motives behind uh, what has happened in architecture through history, uh, you soon come to the realization that uh, no one's ever stumbled across or came around to say, hey, uh, you know, what do we do, uh, why don't we start thinking about uh, people as a, as, as uh, uh, as a mass uh, and all of the people and not just a select group. And so basically my approach and, and, and philosophy is, is related to uh, trying to humanize. Uh, I started uh, in the early 60s uh, by abandoning the so-called international style and uh, uh, started in this philosophic approach and I, I don't believe that any meaningful architecture can be meaningful if it's flippant. Uh, if you're bored with something so you do something else this Monday morning and next Monday morning you decide you're bored with that and you do something else. Uh, it's very uh, 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 superficial uh, and, and of course uh, I don't think it will uh, stand the test of history. But what we're dealing with is a new society, uh, new problems related to uh, the society in which we live, and uh, consequently, uh, the architect of today, I feel, has to face those issues. And, and, uh, and it goes right back to people again. Well, it's almost 15 years, Jonathan, that you have been covering the career of John Portman. What about it initially, and what continues to engage you? What's the significance of Mr. Portman's work in business organization for other architects and real estate developers? Well, I first met John Portman, I guess it was in 1964. <coughs> At that time, I was an, an editor of Architectural Record magazine, and the editor-in-chief had said to me that because I'd been to the Yale School of Architecture and uh, only knew people who went to cocktail parties in New York City, that I ought to uh, make a trip to the... Uh, we have, all the editors were given territories, and my territory was the South, so I was a reverse traveling salesman. I was knocking on doors to see whether there were any buildings that we ought to publish. And I knocked on John Portman's door in the mer merchandise mart. At a very early stage in your uh, 
new professional career. That is the and one that was which the very with. first development, wasn't that it? That was the first building, that that, or the second building that John had developed the building. And I saw that he was a radically new way of practicing architecture. Because the traditional way of practicing architecture is to assist in social climbing. As the architect is the person who validates the status of the newly rich person or the newly rich in, in, institution. And therefore, the architect is a kind of lackey to these social climbing uh, people or institutions. Uh, John, uh, by making himself his own client, short-circuited that whole process. Well, what is the significance currently to architects and, to, and developers in terms of both the practice and the business organization? Well, I think that one thing that we ought to understand is that John Portman is, in fact, a very radical architect. But I think that he reminds me a little bit of the president, President Carter, because they have a way of, I'll tell you why he reminds me of it. It's the way that he uh, talks about very complicated issues in a very, not in a simplified way, not a simplistic way, but a simplified way. I said this to you over dinner a, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and by saying that architecture is for people, he's making a very uh, general statement, and by not making invidious comparisons, because people from the South are much more gentlemanly than people up here in the Northeast are. Uh, he doesn't say, for example, that Walter Netsch, the latest building as published in Architectural Record, is based on a pattern which is entirely geometric, that is, the origin of the building and its whole arrangement is based on an abstract geometric system. So when John says that the person is where he wants to start, he is also saying the abstract geometric system is where I do not want to start, or I am not concerned that uh, I make a particular point with my building, which is a development of an idea which I have had, and this is the occasion on which I want to make the idea. In fact, I think that John Portman is practicing a kind of environmental psychology, uh, which is very much related to real estate development, because in, a, say, a department store, you are subject to environmental psychology the moment you walk in the door. You may have noticed that the refrigerators are not right inside the door. They're on the eighth floor, and you walk by gloves and neckties and handbags and so forth. And I think it's very interesting that John began his career as a designer of department stores. And I think that uh, the starting with people and understanding what motivates them and then understanding how you can take that and, in fact, uh, put it rather crudely, make money from it, that is, show how it can, in fact, be done, uh, is a very radical new way of looking at architecture. Oh, Jonathan, you've pointed out to us that there are regional difference in ma differences in manners. Now I think we should turn to see if there are regional differences in taste as well. One of the reasons that the three of you have come together is because of one project, among others, and that is the proposed Times Square Hotel. On the one hand, it is a testament to the reputation of John Portman that this has become known, in, at least in the popular press, as the Portman Hotel, even though I presume that is not the name. Absolutely not. <laughs> Can you tell us something about the design of this building and how did it take its present form and just what is that form? Well, <clears throat> when you go into design a, a, a a building, of course, you have to take all the uh, factors into consideration. And to do what we are attempting to do in Times Square, we had to take into consideration Times Square as it exists today, uh, uh, not as we envision that it will exist 10 years from now or 15 years from now. And we so consequently, uh, the environment in which uh, uh, the structure uh, is to be designed becomes a very important uh, ingredient. Uh, also, the, the fact that uh, uh, it is uh, an unusual location uh, historically, at least for a uh, hotel uh, in uh, New York City, uh, we had to make sure that what we what we did would uh, uh, succeed from the standpoint of, of uh, if we did less, it would be much more dangerous to do something less than to do something more. Uh, the same philosophy occurred in, uh, in Detroit in the design of Renaissance Center. Uh, to have done less would have uh, uh, guaranteed failure. Uh, and to a much lesser degree, the, the uh, design of the, and the whole programming of the uh, New York Hotel. 
uh, in Times Square uh, uh, came from from this. Uh, we had to create a, a, an environment that was uh, of such scale and magnitude and uh, of such desirability uh, that during a period of transition, uh, it, even if it had to, it could stand alone. Uh, we were very concerned uh, in the design with uh, uh, security uh, because of the uh, fear of crime in the area. Uh, how do we get uh, uh, people into the area? Uh, so the design took all of that into consideration. Uh, we had control points. We felt that this would only be a temporary uh, situation that uh, if this project uh, is implemented, of course, it will uh, be a catalyst for many other things to happen and will happen and can change the whole environment of Times Square. But uh, to take the dimmest view and say that uh, it won't be a catalyst and it won't cause all these things and Times Square won't change, uh, then you have to design defensively. Uh, this becomes a very uh, uh, important ingredient in the approach uh, of, uh, uh, of the design concept. Uh, we've attempted to do a, uh, uh, a building there that would be of uh, something that was not skin deep, which is Times Square. Uh, everything's a shirt front, it's just skin deep. Uh, but something that was uh, uh, that had real substance to it uh, that would begin to uh, uh, be the catalyst. And frankly, that's what excited me about coming to New York and attempting to, uh, uh, wouldn't be much of a challenge to do a hotel on Fifth Avenue or Park Avenue. Uh, but to, uh, to go into to this and, and with the historical significance of Times Square as an area, to go in there and and uh, and it's been years, you know, and, and we've spent literally millions of dollars uh, trying to do this thing, uh, and think, you know, I could have done many other things, uh, but the challenge there is uh, is something that I think uh, has been one that we just could not uh, uh, back away from, and so. Uh, we have uh, proceeded and, and uh, continued with perseverance, and I think we're very, very close, and hopefully uh, uh, in the next few weeks or months, we'll have something very positive to say about the implementation. What will the complex look like? Can you tell us some of the components, and how similar is it to what we've come to expect from Portman Hotels? Well, you know, uh, we have no preconceived ideas. The only preconceived idea that I have about anything uh, goes back to uh, uh, space. You know, we're uh, people in space. That's what architecture is all about. And and uh, 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 when you when you get into a situation, uh, all space breaks down into two basic fundamental areas: public and private space. Uh, and cities uh, have been uh, building a lot of private space, uh, increasing density. Uh, the city started out with uh, a little one and two story buildings on the corner and then they expanded and expanded and then that came back and erased those and they had four and five story buildings and so forth and so on. So they get to 50 story buildings. The street and sidewalk stayed the same. Uh, which is the public space. And all this increased density keeps piling up uh, on, on, on an infrastructure that doesn't uh, expand uh, to carry it. And our whole uh, approach to, to urban design has been to try to open things up and to, to, to let, uh, let buildings breathe, not only internally but uh, uh, externally as well. Uh, and, and so space is really the key. Uh, when you have uh, the original uh, Regency was uh, 
uh, which we'd never done a hotel before. Uh, this is in Atlanta that we're in talking Atlanta, about. In uh, Atlanta, many years ago. And uh, here, this was in a, on the busiest street in the city, and it was crowded and traffic. And we started analyzing the hotel, and, and, and you, you say, what is a hotel in a central city in an urban setting? And it's a t at that time, it was a tower. Um, had a very uh, cramped lobby with a newsstand over in one corner and a dark bar over in another and a few leather chairs sitting around. And uh, you got in a closed elevator and went up and, and you got out into a, a narrow corridor, double loaded, and you went into a, a room which had a hole in the wall and a bed and a, and a, and a, a table and a chair over in the corner and that was the hotel. Uh, what we really wanted to do was to explode all of that, to, 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 to give something to the urban scene that the urban scene needed desperately, and that was space. And, and the explosion of creating a, a huge uh, 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 space and a volume which uh, would create a sense of excitement and serenity uh, at the same time, uh, which uh, is a paradox. But. Uh, to create within a, a, an urban setting, uh, off the, the heavy trafficked area, uh, the feeling of, uh, of a resort, if you may. But space is the key, and, and our cities need space. We need space uh, inside our buildings, we need space outside of our buildings. We need to think in terms of people instead of things. Uh, things have taken over our cities. Uh, the streets are, 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 are mobbed, the sidewalks are cramped. Uh, and, you know, we came along with the Seagram's building and we set, put a little plaza out there and we had a fountain. It was wonderful, wonderful. But, uh, you know, we, we haven't gone beyond that. What we really have to do is to think uh, in terms of external and internal space. And this is what we've tried to do in, this, in, in, in the New York Hotel, uh, is that we've created, I Are think... Are the private spaces a departure, too? Because as I can recall, uh, most of the innovation in Portman hotels are in the public spaces, and they're rather traditional, and if you will, conventional in the private spaces. Well, you get to a point of, point of economics, uh, uh, and, and private space uh, is... Uh, and there's many more private spaces than there are public spaces. For instance, there's 2,000. A hotel room is a private space. A, a private office, that's a private space. When people leave the private space, they enter the public arena. And uh, when they enter the public arena, uh, that's where you, the play begins. Uh, and uh, the private space is uh, essentially a functional uh, uh, space. But the public arena goes much beyond that, and uh, and that's essentially what the hotel is. Richard, can you tell us something about the overall Times Square area? Perhaps you might describe briefly its evolution from its heyday as a theater district to its current state, and tell us where it's going, what are the options, and what effect this hotel will have on the area in general, and specifically on your project, the city at 42nd Street. When eight subway lines were put at 42nd Street in Times Square, the garment industry moved up from Canal Street shortly after the turn of the century. And um, the accessibility of that point made it also logical for the entertainment industry to locate there. Um, out of that grew a symbiosis between the very profitable entrepreneurs in the garment industry and the financing of the Broadway theater, which continues to the present day. With prohibition and the depression and the motion picture, the viability of the theaters began to decline. Entertainment during prohibition became private and so that the public aspects of the theater were no longer uh, something that was um, publicly enjoyed. And the Depression came, and the movies had a bad effect on the theater. And then all those things acting together, I won't sequence them for you, 
uh, produced a decline in the street um, and the conversion of the legitimate houses along 42nd Street at least uh, into um, movie houses. Uh, and then that decline into pornographic uses. Um, the, the theaters north of 42nd Street, because of the inherent vitality of the feeding of money from the garment district and the vitality of the arts in, the New, in New York, survived as an island of, uh, of um, civilization in an area that declined for the very reasons that it originally flourished. Accessibility, uh, primarily. Uh, the transient population through the area is something like 15, in excess of 15 million a year. Now that can, all, that can support theaters and hotels or it can support drug traffic, prostitution, particularly child prostitution, which is the main form of prostitution. Children between nine and 11 on 42nd Street. Uh, and today, uh, the same infrastructure, which once supported, as Fred Astaire said in, uh, I think, Downbeat, the carriage trade on 42nd Street, has uh, produced a negative social ecology, which is reinforced by traffic and accessibility and physical decay, which suggests that society standards are relaxed and so on. Um, what... Uh, what... Uh, John perceived in being willing to adventure on the course of his hotel was that there were latent strengths in the area. Proximity to the central business district, particularly the communications industry, the entertainment industry, uh, the growing health of the theater, uh, the accessibility of the place. All of these things, if you could just turn the critical mass working in the other way, would become strengths and make uh, for a uh, for an area that was lively, glamorous, and extremely suitable for any hotel, especially a, a Portman Hotel. What we're trying to do is, is essentially the same thing on a larger scale. Uh, we believe that the measures required to turn 42nd Street, not 45th Street, which is where John is, he's right, surrounded by the healthiest part of the theater district. 42nd Street is another world, as I discovered by talking to the New York Times who live on 43rd Street and never walk on 42nd Street don't have the faintest idea of what happens 200 feet away from their front door. Um, in order to turn that street around, which is in a far worse uh, situation uh, than, than the site of the, of the Portman Hotel, we feel we have to do something of a much larger scale nature. So we're proposing to use urban renewal powers probably for the first time appropriately, to uh, assemble the land, restore the theaters, build shops and restaurants, and build commercial space to fund the cultural activities of the restored theaters. And that would require uh, about $600 million of investment by the private sector, and about $40 million of money not otherwise available to New York from special federal programs to assist in the acquisition of the land. Then all the things that presently support the disease of the street would once again support its health. It would help the garment industry, it would help the theater district, it would help the central business district, and it would provide a relief valve for the westward growth, planned westward growth, I hope, of uh, commercial space so that the central business district can expand instead of on top of itself, as John alluded to earlier, dumping more and more people on the same size street, move that development westward in a much more rational way with, with lower densities, which we're proposing in, uh, in our development. Are you telling us, though, Richard, that this redevelopment will cater to entertaining executives and the privileged middle class? No. Uh, How do you intend to accommodate all classes and serve a whole variety of functions? The third, fourth, and fifth floor of the two blocks on either side of 42nd Street between 7th and 8th Avenue would be a um, kind of cultural entertainment center available to the general public, not at Broadway prices, but at the price of a movie ticket. And we hope to get foreign and American corporations to pay for theater, dance, ballet, 
and film uh, experiences that will be available to the public, in fact, 12 hours of various kinds of entertainment of one kind or another for the price of a movie ticket, four fifty or $5. There will also be ballet and opera. Believe it or not, there's a 750-seat chamber opera house, which was built by Oscar Hammerstein for David Belasco in 1906, which has the finest Italian plaster work in the United States. Right on that block, it shows triple feature pornography today, despite the uh, commentary to the contrary by the owner of the theater in the New York Times a couple of days ago. Um, that theater we would hope to operate as a, um, perhaps for the Big Apple Circus sometimes, or for uh, uh, chamber opera, or uh, the Bronx Opera, or performances from the Brooklyn Academy, and so on. And we would subsidize the tickets out of the revenues from the office space that we would build around Times Square. The commercial parts of this project will fund subsidized cultural activities on the block in exactly the same way that the condominium tower over the Museum of Modern Art is going to pay for a doubling of the museum space underneath it. It's the Before same principle. Before we get into that subject, and indeed we will, Perhaps you should tell us a little bit more about the city in, at 42nd Street. It sounds, of course, like an intriguing idea. You've talked about hundreds of millions of dollars, urban renewal designation, a designation that other entrepreneurial architectural developer types are seeking as well. Is it realistic? Will it happen? What is its current form? Should it be attacked incrementally? Is it too big? We've concluded after spending a, a very great deal of money with the help of the philanthropic community. We are a not-for-profit organization which is funded by foundations and so on. That an incremental approach to the development of this, this part of 42nd Street will not work. You know that there is a superb organization called the 42nd Street Redevelopment Corporation which has restored a group of of uh, theaters between uh, 10th and 11th Avenue. There, the incremental approach, buying one theater and then another and fixing it up, works. But the real marketplace for crime, uh, uh, pornography, and uh, child prostitution is on the blocks between 7th and 8th Avenue, where the, uh, where the real value of the property is uh, abysmally low and where there is nothing uh, in any building above the first floor. And uh, two or three of the buildings are actually have been turned off. It has, they have no electricity and light, and the uses that are in their base are, are, are literally squatters that have just gone into the cold shell of a dead building and, and started doing business of one kind or another. Uh, when you have a situation like that, with the highest felony rate, the highest violent crime rate, and the center of, uh, of prostitution and drug selling, you can't do it on a building-by-building -building basis. You have to develop a critical mass sufficient to turn it around. And in order to do that, you need a certain dimension to the project in order that the project, once it's built, will serve the general public as well as the connoisseur of ballet and opera. You have to have sources, new sources of subsidy if you're not going to be raiding the, the sources that Lincoln Center and the Brooklyn Academy use. So we're trying to use the, the commercial space to pay for, the, for these cultural subsidies so that our sister cultural institutions will look upon us as, uh, as supporters in the struggle for civilization and not as enemies trying to get in at the trough that they barely get enough sustenance from. So we do need to, we do in this instance, need to um, make the big gesture. The re, the, you ask whether it's realistic, Barbara Lee. It's realistic in that three of the most uh, successful uh, developers in the North American continent are willing to come in and put up the money. Who are they? Um, well, the, the three that we are currently uh, talking with the most are uh, a Canadian developer uh, called Olympia and York that, that own the Eurus buildings and pay about $30 million in real estate taxes to New York City right now and uh, the Helmsley Organization and Rockefeller Center. These are others who are interested um, and who are trying to work with us to get a, a financially feasible plan. What is difficult, though, is the public's perception 
shared by thoughtful people in government. There is a negative feeling about large-scale government intervention in the marketplace. There are the memories of projects that were associated with Robert Moses, where there were large numbers of residential relocation and so on. I hasten to add that nobody lives on these blocks. They're just uh, uh, either empty or uh, uh, commercial uses. Um, so that there is a, there's a good de degree of caution, let's put it that way politely, that we're encountering for the fear that the public will perceive this kind of intervention as big government moving in uh, on behalf of private real estate interests, which is not the, the way we view the project being not for profit. Our beginning was with the people, with the theaters, and with the uses that we could add to the area that would be supportive of its history and, um, and the healthy forces that are operating in it. And there are healthy forces, forces to the north and the south. So I don't know how realistic it is. It's up to the city government and then to the public approval process, which will take six months thereafter once we start public hearings, if we get to that point. Richard talks about symbiosis, and John Portman mentioned catalyst. In fact, uh, it was a word that engaged and concerned me. I wonder if you would tell us, Jonathan, objectively, if you would say a word about Portman hotels throughout the country and their track record as catalysts. Tell us about them as buildings which have a major effect on what is around them, and which ones you think have worked best, and how they have worked. Of course, there's an attribution problem. That is, John Portman has done a number of hotels, but nowhere near as many hotels as people think John Portman has done, because there have been so many imitation John Portman hotels done. <laughs> So the, we're talking about uh, the, the Hyatt Regency in Atlanta. We're talking about the Embarcadero Hotel in San Francisco. We're talking about Bonaventure in Los Angeles and the Renaissance, the, the hotel in the Renaissance Center in, in uh, Detroit, and ultimately about Times Square. And the, uh, it's very hard to look at the Atlanta hotels and also the Peachtree Plaza Hotel in Atlanta. It's very hard to look at them outside of the context of Peachtree Center, uh, which the whole development of that part of Peachtree Street. It's really uh, Portman's kingdom. Uh, he owns it all, and uh, he is lord of it all, and it's, it's all to his design. Uh, perhaps the most important from a catalytic point of view, if you want to pursue the catalytic concept, would be the uh, uh, Embarcadero Center Hotel in San Francisco, because that's in, in San Francisco's financial district. And one of the requirements of the Urban Renewal Project, of which that's a part, is that there be a hotel there. And I'm not sure how excited, I don't know about John, but I don't think the other investors were that excited about building a hotel in that location. So that this hotel had to be spectacular because otherwise it wouldn't do any business. And I was at the AIA convention in 1972 before the hotel opened, but when the lobby space was open. And we discovered that the favorite recreation in downtown San Francisco was to go down to the Embarcadero lobby and look at it. <laughs> Well, I don't know if that has been the experience, if I may bring up a less than uh, positive reaction on the part of some critics to the Renaissance Center in Detroit, which itself is a spectacular complex, four office towers, 73-story hotel, and I assume it was designed to help revitalize Detroit's deteriorating downtown area. And as you know, and as many of us know, there has been a great deal of concern voiced about that center. Some of it centers on the fact that the sleek and the bold design perhaps might even be a bit too dramatic for that city and that it was not an integral part of its environment. How do you react to that uh, criticism? That sometimes some of the hotels are aloof from the cities that are around them, that they create an alternative urbanism that is not plugged into what is considered the existing cityscape. I'm sure that's something by now that is familiar to you. How do you react to that? <laughs> he said vehemently. Well, you know, it's one thing to look at something and not understand, uh, uh, take something out of context and not understand uh, why things are the way they are. Uh, to understand Renaissance Center, uh, you have to understand a lot of things. You have to understand the basic uh, uh, situation that Detroit uh, found itself. 
uh, at the time that we started that project. The first time I went in at the, at the re request of uh, Mr. Ford, uh, I stayed at the Pontchartrain Hotel and I got out of a taxi. And uh, as I was checking in, I was told to uh, not walk on the streets. Uh, that if I left the hotel to take a taxi and go to a restaurant and come out of the restaurant and not walk and take a taxi back. Uh, and, you know, this was the, the, the uh, circumstance in, in which we found ourselves. Uh, we were uh, requested to come up with something that would uh, uh, revitalize Detroit and to uh, change uh, the attitudes of people outside of Detroit uh, about the city of Detroit but even more than that to begin to change the attitudes of of uh, the Detroit people about themselves uh, which was a very tall order and uh, we were given a site which was along the Detroit River and the Jefferson uh, Boulevard, which was a, a, a freeway, a 11 lane freeway, which separated uh, us from the, uh, the city. So a vehicular river, so to speak, and a, and a river over here, and we're to build something uh, in between. So we were cut off from the existing fabric of the city, and uh, uh, we were, uh, whatever we did, we realized we would be an island. And it became uh, uh, clear to us that the most important thing was to create an environment and to create something of such size and magnitude. Here again, if we had gone in to build uh, one building, uh, as we did in, in San Francisco, where we were building, uh, and, in, and in Atlanta and Peachtree Center, where we were building uh, against existing strength, uh, and, and adding on to an existing uh, city fabric that was entirely different. Uh, here we were cut off from the existing city fabric and uh, we had a, 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 the citizens uh, who were afraid. Uh, the, the fear was the, one of the biggest problems we had. So we had to do two things. We had to do, number one, we had to do something of such magnitude uh, that it could stand alone and we had to design it in such a way that that when people came there they had a feeling of, of being safe that it got away from the fear uh, uh, context uh, that uh, existed in the city and uh, so we've been accused of building a fortress uh, uh, in Renaissance Center and in a sense it is a fortress in that uh, it, it has this uh, vehicular moat on one side and, and, and the Detroit River on the other side. Uh, but we were isolated physically to begin with. Uh, and uh, so we came up with the proposal to Mr. Ford that, uh, that it was absolutely necessary that he build four 40-story office buildings, uh, a 70-plus story hotel, uh, 350,000 feet of retail and uh, parking to satisfy all of that uh, and to do it all at one time and it was going to cost 350 million dollars. Uh, this was quite a shock. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, he uh, went through it and, and uh, after thinking about it he came came back and uh, came around and said, uh, let's go. I'm ready. <laughs> and uh, it really happened that way. And, and, uh, but I, I uh, was convinced that to do less, it would have been an absolute failure. Uh, consequently, we've had critics and, and architectural types who go and say, you know, that's divorced from the city. It was divorced to start with. They don't recognize the 11-lane 11, 11 freeway and how we'd get across there. Uh, and that it's a, it's a, it's, it's a fortress and it's, it's turned inward. All of that's very, very true, but it all grew out of the environmental conditions and the social conditions uh, that existed there. 
Uh, it was right. It has been very, very successful. We're now building phase two. Uh, Rockefeller Center has joined uh, the Ford Motor Land Development Company to build phase two. Uh, and we're in the design of phase three. It's been extremely uh, successful and uh, there have been articles even here in the New York Times and in, uh, uh, in the Detroit uh, papers that people are again now walking the streets of, uh, of Detroit and the sidewalks for the first time uh, since the early 60s. Uh, and they attribute this to Renaissance Center. It, it has created a different uh, uh, atmosphere, a different feeling in the public. Uh, the, the cab drivers, instead of moaning and groaning now, to, uh, start telling you how great the city is. And so uh, uh, on, on many fronts, it's, uh, it's very, very successful. I think the critics are criticizing uh, from a very superficial point of view and from strictly a, an external point of view without really understanding uh, how uh, the whole evolution and the problems that uh, uh, that were being faced. Uh, the uh, success uh, of the project has uh, uh, caused uh, other developments in the city uh, and there are now about five or six uh, uh, major developments going on in Detroit which were uh, an outgrowth of uh, Renaissance Center. In describing the Times Square project, and by the way, what will its name be? <laughs> I don't know. You have a suggestion? <laughs> yeah, but I will. <laughs> uh, we're open to suggestions. Uh, I'm sure you'll have many from this group. Mm -hmm. We uh, we would like to name it uh, something that uh, would be uh, special to New York City and not just just another name. Uh, there have been many names uh, mentioned. Uh, uh, the Astor, for one, which uh, of course there was an Astor Hotel there many many years ago. Uh, but we, we still uh, are looking for a name. We haven't uh, selected it yet. In describing that project earlier, you said sometimes one has to design defensively. Um, I wonder, a mechanical, technological change of the tape. Um, when you said that, I thought in terms of the same problem and the same arguments that exist in terms of other centers that you have designed throughout the country. Is that going to be a problem in Times Square as well? I mean, are the hotel stark concrete walls, will they create a cold presence in the midst of that part of town? Is it really turning one's back on the city by creating a separate city within the city? No, uh, I don't think so at all. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, uh, when you get into a, a city where you have many, many high-rise uh, structures, uh, people are only aware of their surroundings uh, uh, related to a 15 degree above the horizontal of the, of, of the sight line. And, uh, you know, you can look up and, and of course, that's, uh, and, and see what's up there. But uh, just the, the normal experience is, is really related only to a 15 degree uh, uh, above the horizontal. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, since the, since the uh, original design of the Times Square Hotel where we were criticized for having designed it as too uh, sophisticated for Times Square, it didn't have the character of the, of the city. Uh, and we, we have uh, changed uh, uh, the, the basic uh, uh, ingredients of the uh, building at the base uh, caused by many factors, one being that we had a submerged theater uh, and we discovered that we couldn't build a submerged theater because of all the, uh, the trains underground and the vibration and there was no way we could isolate it and so we had to pull the theater out. And uh, consequently we have redesigned the whole base of the building to give uh, it a more uh, Times Square look uh, with what the, is that with, book? The, with the <laughs> well the Times Square look I guess uh, that you would say it's uh, it's it's like light and uh, signs and kinetic uh, uh, activity in, in, in the facades uh, it's uh, it's a very special kind of thing and and we've tried to incorporate that kinetic quality of Times Square 
uh, in, in the uh, uh, new design of the base. And uh, I think that uh, uh, we're very pleased with it. Uh, uh, and and it's, it's, it's good that the trains were there. I think we have an improvement. John Portman is lucky enough to have found a way to be his own patron. Jonathan, you might tell us who represents the public interest in terms of design. Oh, Richard Weinstein likes to talk about the uh, development process as a three-handed game between the community, the uh, government, and the private investor. Now, the community doesn't always feel that it's, it's represented by government. Uh, the urban designer could conceivably work for any of these three. So uh, all of these uh, interests are, are uh, working, we hope, together, sometimes in conflict. One way that government, and this goes back to the question you asked me uh, earlier on, which I was reluctant to take 50 minutes to we answer. Observe. But the, uh, uh, I like to talk about designing cities without designing buildings. This comes a lot of it out of the work that Richard Weinstein and Jack Robertson and uh, I and others did in the city planning department uh, 10 or 12 years ago using the existing zoning controls and the fact that New York City has a very strong uh, real estate market, or uh, on and off, uh, to uh, uh, get a sense of direction over what's happening. One of my favorite tags is that as the environmental and zoning regulations tend to specify development, if you can get what you ask for, why can't you get what you want? So what Richard and the rest of us and I learned is that if you made some minor, relatively minor adjustments in what was apparently very boring legal text, that you could get some quite spectacular differences on the ground. And of course, every city is different. When I work in Pittsburgh, they have a different way of, uh, they have a very permissive zoning ordinance, but they have a discretionary review by the city before any building is built. So in that context, designing cities without designing buildings means laying down ground rules for developers uh, to follow before they design their buildings. However, there's also, I'm not going to talk for 50 minutes, but there are a few other uh, aspects of it, which is that the, the design of the transportation system, uh, the de design of the park system, uh, highways, streets, uh, public buildings, uh, all of these things contribute to shaping the city. And in most instances, while the decisions about them are made for good reasons, they're not made from the point of view of city design. It's just uh, a process which is proceeding uh, perfectly rationally within very narrow confines, but viewed overall totally without direction. So what an urban designer would like to do is design a city. And that does not mean making a picture of it the way it would look in 20 years. It means trying to get into the process and shape it as you go along. Oh, I guess it was about 10 years ago that you wrote and talked about how optimistic you were about the future of cities. And you call, called for, and I guess continue to call for, a national planning policy. Um, to what end and how optimistic is there cause for that optimism to remain? Well, I said I was optimistic by temperament there are a lot of problems which we haven't figured out how to solve. And one of them, and to put it very simply, is that between 20 and 25 percent of the people in this country don't seem to fit into our economic system. Now this is a sort of pre-inflation estimate, maybe as uh, fixed income people lose more and more of their ability to buy things, that that percentage goes up. And our system works very well for a large number of the people in this country. It doesn't work at all for some, and it's in between for a perhaps growing number of people who are having a lot of trouble uh, holding their lives together. Now, what I said is that short of reforming society completely, which at the time that I wrote that book, a lot of my friends believed was the only way to deal with it. Uh, I think that the Maoists are smaller in number now than they were 10 years ago, as Albania remains the only correct country in the entire world as far as Maoist philosophy is concerned. But I said that uh, we, it was a long journey. You were not going to come up with a magic solution, and we, but you might as well start. And that's what I think is being optimistic by temperament. I think that perhaps uh, uh, on balance, things are a little bit better for the center city at the present time than they were 10 or 12 years ago. They're no better for the inner city residential districts. 
they are starting the, the you're starting to see cracks in the older suburbs that perhaps weren't as visible 10 or 12 years ago. So it's uh, we're about where we were, and the problems are a little different. Were you nodding in agreement, Richard? Since you talked about long journeys, may I shift gears for a moment for an area of my particular concern, and that is, I guess, something that was envisioned. Uh, Barbara, can I just say something? Please. Uh, I note in the things that I've said and that both Johns have said, there's a common thread, and the common thread is that you have to understand the processes that produce phenomena in cities before you can change them. And that, I mean, John approaches it by, he begins by talking about people, but he also has a very, as you can see, a very sharp eye for the pre-existing circumstances, whether they're 11 lane throughways in a position by the Detroit River, which uh, give a contextual understanding of what you have to do with your building. Just the way you talk about a human context, you talk about a physical t context. John talks about a legal context. There's also a real estate marketplace context. Unless your perception and understanding of these forces John takes them for granted because he was a developer uh, as well as an architect. Unless you understand those forces, you can't really do anything about cities on a large scale basis. That is, you can't deal with the kind of impacts that Renaissance Center has without understanding how these processes function to begin with, both at the level of the individual and at the collective level of the way cities function. There was a whole generation of architects and planners which preceded uh, all of us on this stage, who disassociated themselves from that body of knowledge and believed that they were making a radical break with the past. Um, and it was those people who governed uh, the education of planners and architects in this country for two decades. And to a large degree, the state of the cities that, that we all found in different ways when we began to be interested in them professionally was uh, resulted from, uh, from the absenteeism of professionals uh, at the time that decisions were being made that made those cities the way they are. Whether they were uh, 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 mortgage plans promoted by the federal government for soldiers coming back after the war that built the suburbs and the highway system and all the rest of it, the 11 lanes that John had to deal with. These were all decisions that were made by people who had no sense of the context and had no commitment, professional commitment, to becoming involved in them because they regarded that kind of involvement as, um, as somehow um, uh, bringing them down to a level of compromise with forces that they regarded as, uh, that they were, revol they were revolting against that we're now in a counter-revolution uh, situation. Counter we're all counter-revolutionaries up here. Revisionists. Uh. I'm now going to be a transitional spacer, taking a leaf from your book. And mine will be transitional phrases. I'm going to come back to my original question. And you talked of perception, and I will extend that if I may. What I started to say was that it was almost 60 years since the Bauhaus first opened. And what I'd like to have you address yourselves to for a moment, if you would, is the collaboration that the Bauhaus envisioned between modern art and modern architecture. Whatever happened to it? It's alive and well. Could you tell us where? Well, I, well, I, I think it's alive and well, certainly in, in, the, in most of the projects that we're working on. Uh, Embarcadero Center, for instance, uh, I guess we have uh, at least two and a half to three million dollars in major, uh, major commissioned work uh, throughout the complex. Uh, we have taken uh, uh, that as as part of the uh, as a necessary uh, ingredient to the type of environment uh, that we're trying to create. Have the works been specifically commissioned, or are they merely purchased, as is often the case, uh, to fit into a particular place? In, in, each, we, in each case, they have been specifically commissioned. Do you work directly with the artists? Yes, very much so. 
And how comfortable are you with the idea of such a collaboration? I, I think I'm very comfortable. Uh, the the uh, I think what the architect the architect's role, and and and, and we've worked with many many uh, different artists. Uh, uh, I find that uh, uh, the most difficult thing is that they uh, it's it's hard for them to do something in context. The uh, artist. The artist. The artists. Do most architects permit them that opportunity? Oh yes, I think the architect's role uh, has to be in determining scale, uh, material, uh, texture, uh, uh, color, if you may, uh, form, or the kind of form, or or, or direction of form, uh, because it if it is involved in a spatial context. And that spatial context has been created in the architect's mind, and he has a feel for the form and the space and the and the kind of thing that should happen at a specific point. Uh, an artist who doesn't have that and is looking at drawings and models, uh, I have found that uh, they really do not understand uh, scale. First of all, scale. And uh, if you're if you're dealing in large scale, and maybe one of the reasons is that is that most artists uh, deal in museum type things. Uh, well, more and more there are certainly smaller, public works Smaller art. things, and uh, we're at Embarcadero Center, for instance, uh, we have one piece in, uh, which was uh, done by the Swiss artist Willie Gutmann. Uh, uh, it's a group of three pieces, one's 84 feet high. How do you select the artist? And, uh, we select the artist uh, on the basis of the kind of uh, uh, apposition uh, in context uh, related to the space and to the architecture. Uh, the artist that we feel that uh, uh, can uh, provide uh, that special quality which we think that will be most compatible uh, with the type of setting that uh, is being created. and. There's much uh, freedom, uh, of course, and uh, we don't try to, to impinge on the artist in any way. Uh, it's problem solving. All design, whether it's sculpture or anything else, is really problem solving. Whether we're designing a building, we have to take all the problems into consideration. So what we really do is we spell out the, the problems for the artist and, and the kind of considerations that we want him to take uh, uh, as he and develops his idea, uh, we certainly don't want to inhibit him. We want to give him as much freedom as possible. And, uh, but there is a necessary collaboration that must take place. Well, there are some critics who, that have suggested that there is both a psychological and or a professional barrier between artists and architects that prevents a profound sympathy between those two arts, let alone collaboration. What do you think about that, Richard? I don't, um, I'm too uh, um, nostalgic about the historical examples of the fusion between the visual arts and architecture. You think of the cathedrals or the uh, mosaics and Byzantine domes and so on. I feel that we don't have anything even remotely approaching that kind of rapport on a conceptual level between works of architecture and works of sculptural or uh, two-dimensional embellishment. And I think that's a consequence of the kind of culture and civilization we li live in and the kind of pressures that are on us. I think sculpture is an expression of the, of the individual and architecture is an expression of the collective institution of society. And when there are a, varieties, a variety of ways that the individual can be related to society, rather than a systematic hierarchical way, let's take the feudal way, where everybody knew exactly where he was on the ladder, which is why you have a, a ladder of form in a cathedral, in a sense, from the, the biggest shape to the smallest embellishment. When that breaks down, when there are multiple ways to live, we have a pluralistic society and everyone has a different idea of how we ought to be related to the social order, you necessarily get a break between the, uh, the conceptual arts and the contextual arts, the second being architecture, first being sculpture and painting. And I think there will always be an uneasy relationship between these two because I think that's the nature of the times we live in. 
so I, uh, while John has tried heroically to bridge that by cultivating artists who will build 84 foot high pieces, if you really go into the piece them, itself and examine it and wonder just how good it is at a, at a piece and whether it's really better as a paperweight or better 84 feet high, then the whole thing becomes much more depressing because I, I don't feel the quality of what's being done uh, is that commendable to begin with. And whether it's 84 feet or two feet isn't the issue. It's, it's, it's the relationship underneath which I find lacking. Alas, that happens to be, in my view, that, that's just a consequence of the times we live in. I don't think much can be done about it. There are two differing views. Can you say something about the collaboration between artists and architects in this country? Is it healthy? Can there be closer collaboration? And should there be closer collaboration? Well, at least in retrospect, the uh, Renaissance and the Gothic or medieval uh, periods look as if there was much closer rapport between artists and architects. If we could go back to those times and actually find out what went on in the decision-making process of designing a tympanum over a door or something like that, we may find something entirely different. But we are used to looking at our own age as an age of individualism, where the collective vision that we think animated, say, the Renaissance doesn't exist anymore. And there have been various attempts to bring back that collective vision uh, certainly what is called sometimes the American Renaissance, if you saw the, at the <coughs> Brooklyn Museum. Uh, I think of what Richard Norman Shaw said about efforts of that kind at the end of the, his life, that what he had been dealing with would be cut flowers, beautiful but dead. That they had the simulation of the collaboration, but not the actual collaboration. In reaction to that, you have the Bauhaus, which sought to have true collaboration by reducing everything to a very uh, abstract and minimal, minimal area so as to find the common denominator. If you go down the uh, escalators in the Pan American building, you will see the integration of art and architecture. That red, white, and black series of panels is by Joseph Albers, <coughs> Gropius of the Bauhaus. They, they were both of the Bauhaus. Gropius was the consulting architect for the building. I think that the vision of modernist painting and uh, modern architecture, which you see in the Pan Am building, is one that we are now in the process of reformulating and we don't know where we're going. I think it's quite interesting and exciting, however. We're not exactly bringing back Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, I used to think that was the only avant-garde position that was left. You know, that you, we've, <laughs> we've learned from Las Vegas. We've appreciated uh, Victorian architecture, so that it's standard. Uh, Ethan Allen furniture, sort of fake, uh, fake uh, Colonial, would seem to be the next frontier. But I think that we may be getting past that. And that ar architects and artists are both experimenting in a very interesting way. That architects want to have a richer and more full building in terms of the uh, range of expression that they're seeking. And artists, many of them, seem to me to want to be architects. They want to design environments instead of objects. Some artists think architects want to be artists. Okay. And uh, I think that while there may always be a lot of elbowing aside of each other going on, that that is potentially a very uh, useful uh, conflict. And that something very interesting is going to come out of it. I can't say anything. Uh, totally startling has come out of it yet, but I think it's a promising situation. Is architecture an art or a business? Well, it's a, it is an art. It is a profession. Uh, it is a business. It's all of these things. That's what makes it both exciting and very difficult, because most people don't want architecture to be an art. And so the artist has to sneak, the architect has to sneak the art part of it by the client, or by <laughs> explaining that it. it's in fact very economical and very efficient. Actually, in a recent New York Times interview, Harry Helmsley said, and I think I will quote from him directly, same thing I've asked some of you to do. Let me quote Harry Helmsley directly, if I may. And that is, I think, he says, I think it is important that you have an architect that realizes you are a commercial developer as I am. In the final analysis, if the building doesn't make a profit, the architect hasn't served you. I've seen many a monument that is a monument to the architect, but a disaster for the developer. How do you all react to that statement? I agree with it. I agree with it. There are other categories of building, of course. There's the Ford Foundation, which Ford Foundation gives away money, so it doesn't have the That's same concern. With it. But there are other kinds of buildings. Is involvement in a money-making real estate deal consistent without being esoteric or removed from the realities of contemporary life, yet is it consistent with the museum's role, the museum's mission, as a disinterested and scholarly observer of culture. I don't know why 
commercial profits laundered through a foundation and given to a museum are any different from pop profits directly realized from the museum's control of the development from which the money is coming. And that's my answer to it. I think it's uh, ridiculous uh, in, a, in a civilization whose, whose value-oriented goals were achieved through a marketplace arrangement for the institutions who are anointed to protect those values to divide themselves from the mainstream of American life, which is the marketplace. Uh, and I think uh, if they don't have the nerve and the conviction uh, to be able to make money themselves, then they don't deserve to tell me and my children what values to cherish, since the values I cherish the most uh, uh, arise in a country which has survived and, and made its own civilization on the marketplace, on diversity of choice, on pluralism, on invention, on venture, and adventure too. And all those things are characteristics of the marketplace. It all depends how you look at it. If you look at it uh, the way Thomas Jefferson looked at it, he saw it as he saw the, the exchange of money and property as a uh, as a uh, as the chief purpose and responsibility of a free individual in a democratic society. I wish I could remember his quote precisely, but I've paraphrased it accurately. What did you have in mind with the Trust for Cultural Resources? Obviously, not only one institution. What can it mean for them? When I was in government, I observed, as John noted earlier, that sometimes with the slightest adjustment of a regulatory procedure, enormous amounts of money could be directed in value-oriented directions. We twiddled with the, with the city zoning ordinance and built $17 million worth of theaters for nothing by allowing developers to build three or four floors more, we got two 1,800-seat uh, theaters and two experimental theaters, the American Place Theater and the Circle in the Square, just by a relatively casual, in the scheme of things, a manipulation of the dials, the regulatory dials. It occurred to me that with the arts uh, being desperate for funding, that by intervening in marketplace processes like that one, at more and more sophisticated levels like the Trust for Cultural Resources, that there were sources of money for value-oriented purposes that, were, uh, that made the National Endowment and all the rest of them put together look like a pittance. The Museum of Modern Art's benefit over the next 30 years from that one building project will be $75 million. For a quarter of acre of air, they were paid $17 million in cold cash. That will erase their deficit which was diminishing their endowment by the rate of over a million dollars a year, and it's an endowment of 13 million. They would have been out of business in four or five years. It allows them to build a new museum space and totally renovate their old building, which will double their square footage, give them another auditorium and all the rest of it. And they're doing this with a self-funding source. They don't have to go to the bureaucracy and plead each year on their knees like uh, poverty-stricken waifs to get their money. The, the mayor of New York cut $3 million out of the city's arts budget. The Museum of Modern Arts got its own endowment of $75 million. It doesn't have to worry about the vagary of politics or circumstance. It can more effectively carry out its mission because of its decision to build this project. Uh, it is competitive in the marketplace, in other words. Are you nodding in agreement? I'm certainly nodding in uh, uh, sort of acknowledgement. That's a very cogent uh, description and a very cogent reply. Do you want to go any further than acknowledgement? Well, I think in a perfect world, the government would subsidize the museums and that they wouldn't have to go and in effect take in borders and their air rights in order to be able to make ends meet. <laughs> but this isn't a perfect world. 